Hi. Uh, welcome to another Authors at Google talk here in uh, New York City. It's my great pleasure today to introduce you to Professor George Lakoff, whose new book, The Political Mind, Why You Can't Understand 21st Century Politics with an 18th Century Brain, has just been published. I'm assuming it's not because the 18th century brain is in a jar somewhere. Professor Lakoff is an MIT graduate, uh, which I'm sure will please some people here. Uh, he's applied his work in cognitive linguistics to literature, philosophy, mathematics, and most famously to politics, in uh, publishing Moral Politics, Don't Think of an Elephant, and Whose Freedom? The Battle Over America's Most Important Idea. In his new book, he discusses why Americans vote against their best interests, and here to tell us something about that, Professor George Lakoff. Great. Hi, thank you all for coming, and um, uh, hi to everybody wherever you are uh, out there, and to friends uh, in California. Um, I want to tell you something first, a little bit about the title of the book, um, why the discussion of the 18th century brain. Uh, this country was founded on the basis of enlightenment principles in politics, enlightenment principles like freedom, equality, democracy, and so on. Uh, along with those principles came a theory of mind, which at the time was really great. It came out of Descartes, uh, and it was uh, displaced of sort of more superstitious theories of mind. Uh, however, that theory of mind doesn't work as well uh, in real life as uh, Descartes thought. But it's still around. And let me go over the properties of the uh, Enlightenment mind, which is still there in, in, for many people. Uh, according to Enlightenment reason, reason is supposed to be conscious. You're supposed to know what you're thinking. I think, therefore I am, right? Uh, it's supposed to be dispassionate. Emotion is supposed to get in the way of reason. It's supposed to be literal, applying directly to the world. It's supposed to be logical. If you give someone the facts, they should be able to reason to the right conclusion. It's supposed to be disembodied. It's uh, supposed to be based on self-interest. Uh, that is, the reason you have reason is to just pursue your self-interest. And it's... Um, supposed to be universal. Everybody's supposed to reason in the same way. Uh, after 30 years of neuroscience and cognitive science, we know that every one of those is false. Every <laughs> single one. Uh, the conscious part first. Turns out that about 98% of your thought, of your reason, is unconscious. It's what your brain is doing that is below the level of consciousness. And there's a lot that your brain is doing below the level of consciousness. And your conscious reason, your conscious thinking, is actually based on what's unconscious. And we found lots of ways of studying what's called the cognitive unconscious in great detail. Let's take the dispassionate part. Uh, emotion's supposed to get in the way of reason, according to enlightenment thinking, and sometimes it does. But actually, uh, a lot of other things have been discovered in neuroscience. There's a marvelous book called Descartes' Error by Antonio Damasio. Tony Damasio is one of our great neuroscientists. Uh, what he discovered was that there are certain patients with strokes and other brain damage who lose the ability to uh, feel emotion. That, that part of their brain is gone. What happens when you lose the ability to feel emotion? Do you become like Mr. Spock? Uh, super rational. It turns out the opposite is true. You can't be rational at all. What happens is this, and you can see why. Suppose you had such brain damage, you couldn't feel any emotion, how would you know what to want? How would you know? Would you feel happy or bad about getting what you want or nothing? How would other people feel? If you couldn't tell other people's emotions, you wouldn't know if they'd be angry at you or happy with you. And it turns out that people who have such brain injuries have a terrible time making decisions, and they have a terrible time functioning in the world. They can't function rationally at all. And there's a very good reason for this. Uh, it also has to do with something about the nature of the brain. Uh, 
Amazingly enough, you think with your brains. Not with your computers, but with your brains. Uh, and anything you understand about your computers has to come through your brain. Uh, you don't just think about the world directly. It's got to go through um, uh, some neural connections, not just connections, it's got to go through neural circuitry of a very complicated kind. And that's what we study at the neural computation uh, group at Berkeley, which I've been co-director of for now uh, 20 years. Uh, what we've been able to figure out is the nature of the circuitry needed for various kinds of thought and language. And we now have some understanding of how that works. And it's quite remarkable when you actually figure it out. One thing you see immediately is this. If you're thinking about the world and reasoning about it in terms of what you're going to do, you're going to be using uh, narratives. It turns out that your personality has everything to do with the narratives that you are living out and the ones you're avoiding living out. Uh, as you see around here, there are certain narratives you're living out. And, uh, and very different ones than are being lived out, say, at IBM. Uh, in particular, uh, these narratives, uh, there are lots of them, uh, have a structure that have emotions built in. So, for example, suppose you have a hero-villain narrative. Uh, the um, villain does something horrible to some victim, and you get angry. The hero encounters the villain, and you don't know if he's going to win. There is anxiety, perhaps fear. The hero wins, you get satisfaction, joy, etc. Now, uh, what that means is that the intellectual part having to do with the roles, hero, villain, uh, victim, and with the, the sequence of actions is tied to the emotional parts. How? Via neural circuitry, which has now been largely worked out by various neuroscience labs. Uh, there are two major pathways for your emotions. The um, pathway, the positive pathway, with the neurotransmitter dopamine, the negative pathway with norepinephrine as neurotransmitter. And um, what happens is those pathways go uh, by various parts uh, of the brain, sort of lower down. And um, as depending upon uh, what's activated, you will feel in a positive pathway, happy or satisfied or awe. In the negative pathway, anxiety, fear, anger. Those pathways are connected to other regions, and you get structures that are both emotional and intellectual at once, seamlessly, via neural binding. Right? This is extremely important. There isn't this separation. It's not reason versus emotion. It's not rationality. They are inevitably part and parcel of the same structures and you live and understand your daily life in terms of these structures. So you don't just understand the world directly in its own terms. You're understanding it through those structures, through what are called frames, and you probably have studied that here. Uh, I'll tell, talk a little bit about framing. And through metaphor. We think metaphorically. Now, that's something that is very important to understand and very deep. Uh, by the time you're six or seven, you have learned hundreds of conceptual metaphors, hundreds, without even knowing you've learned them. Uh, and then they later show up in language. What happens is this. Take metaphors like more is up and less is down. Uh, prices rise, fall, they don't literally go up. Or uh, take the idea that um, uh, you have a warm person, a cold person, who is affectionate or non-affectionate. Right? What, why should you have those metaphors? They're not arbitrary. They're same in culture after culture. Why do you have those? How did you learn them? How did you get them? Well, think for a moment about how neural learning works. Uh, suppose you're a child, you're being held by your parents, you feel affection, and you feel warmth, temperature. Two different parts of your brain are active, a temperature center, and a center for emotions. Suppose you're watching water being poured into a glass as a child, or 
books for something else being piled onto a table. You have two parts of your brain active every time you see it, one for quantity and one for verticality. When different parts of your brain in different places are co-active over and over and over and over, day after day after day, what happens? The, uh, you get spreading activation from these centers. Each neuron is connected to 10,000 others. You have lots and lots of activation spreading out along existing pathways. Uh, as they spread out, and this happens over and over again day after day, you strengthen the synapses along those pathways, and then you spread further. And you strengthen those and spread further until a minimal pathway is found and you connect. And then spreading continues until you form a circuit. That is, it gets reinforced as every time that, that you experience these two things occurring together. That circuit physically is the metaphor. That circuit, circuit neurally computes the metaphor, more is up, or affection is warmth, or other metaphors, by the hundred. By the time you're six or seven, your brain has been shaped to think very metaphorically without your even knowing it. So what does this have to do with politics? Well, it turns out that frames, narratives, and metaphors are the way we understand the world, including politics and including morality. Let's take um, politics for a minute. The, um, and then we'll come back and do it for many minutes. Um, the earliest experience that we all have with governance is in your family. That's where you're governed. You're governed by your family. And as a result, what you learn is a metaphor that a governing institution is a family. And that can be a church, it could be a little league team, it could be a business, or it can be a government. Now, uh, and you, so you have, by the time everybody's seven years old, they understand that George Washington is the father of our country. And they don't confuse him with daddy. Uh, and they learn it not just here, but in Mother India, Mother Russia, the fatherland, and so on. Uh, we understand this. Implicitly, unconsciously, it's there, we just use it, we understand it. Uh, when Barack Obama in his Philadelphia speech uh, went and said, uh, they're not their children, they're our children, they're America's kids, everybody knew what he meant, right? Nobody said, what does that mean, right? Uh, he was using that metaphor. Uh, now that metaphor, the nation as family, happens to interact with metaphors for morality, that, and we have lots of them, and they too arise in the same way, and that's how moral systems come about. What morality is about is well-being, your well-being and the well-being of other people. And uh, you can see this uh, if you set up a sentence like, it's, you're better off if blank. And then you say, under what circumstances, when you're growing up as a child, are you better off if blank? So you're better off if you're eating pure food than rotten food. So morality is purity. Immorality is rottenness. He's, that's a rotten thing to do. Okay? You're better off if you can stand erect than if you have to crawl on the ground. So morality is uprightness. Immorality is being a low-down snake. You're better off if, you're, if you listen to your parents, assuming that they're trying to help you, as most parents generally are, uh, than if you're not. So it turns out there's a metaphor that immorality is obedience. You're better off if you're being nurtured by your parents than if you're not. Morality is nurturance. And on and on and on. There are about two dozen, at least, metaphors like this that arise spontaneously, not just here, but in many cultures. There are purification rituals everywhere around the world. Now, uh, what does this have to do with politics? In this country, we have two idealized models of the family based on two of those metaphors. Namely, that morality is obedience and morality is nurturance. And they give rise to conservative thought and progressive thought, to strict father families and nurturing parent families. And what I do in the book is go through exactly how those things work. 
Uh, and you can see this, they work metaphorically, not literally. It's not about your literal family, necessarily. It's about an idealized version. And they each have a mode of thought, a mode of reasoning that goes with it. So for example, uh, the strict father family, which is taught by James Dobson, who is uh, a major figure on the right, says this, you need a strict father, why? He's gotta protect the family, he's gotta support the family by winning competitions. Kids are born bad, uh, they just do what they want to do. We've got to teach them right from wrong. The strict father knows right from wrong. He teaches them right from wrong by punishing them when they do bad. It's got to be painful enough so that they will avoid doing bad, do what's right, and then they get internal discipline to become moral people, and that's the only way that that works. And not only that, if they're disciplined, they can go out in the market and become prosperous. So what if you're not prosperous? That means you're not disciplined. If you're not disciplined, you can't be moral, so you deserve your poverty. What are social programs? Social programs are uh, programs that give people things they have not earned. Well, what does that do from that point of view? In that model, it turns out, if you haven't earned something, you don't have an incentive to be disciplined. If you don't have an incentive to be disciplined, you'll lose your discipline, you won't be able to take care of yourself, and you won't be moral. So there are very good reasons not to have social programs, they're doubly immoral. This is part of conservative reasoning, it comes out of the strict father model and then applies metaphorically, not literally, but metaphorically to social issues. Similarly, uh, suppose you take the other view, the nurture and parent view, what does that say? It says, nurturance is empathy. You care about your children. You identify with them, and it's responsibility. You set limits. You have to protect them. You have to make sure they're educated, and so on. Okay? That's what it is to be a nurturing parent, and you raise them to be nurturers of others. That is, you want them to care about other people, to be responsible for themselves, and be responsible for others as well sort of the opposite of indulgence. Now, what does that have to do with politics? When you map that onto politics, it says that a government, a democratic government, is one where, where people care about each other, where empathy is at the heart of it. And when that's the case, what does that impose on the structure of a government? It says the structure of a government has two moral missions, protection and empowerment. Protection is not just military protection, it's, uh, it's uh, consumer protection, it's worker protection, it's environmental protection, it's safety nets, it's health care. What about empowerment? It's not just building roads and communication systems and educational systems, it's also um, upholding the banking system, having a, uh, a stock market having a court system, having an energy system. In this country, nobody can make a dime in business without government empowerment, without all of those things being provided. And what is taxation on this view? Taxation is what you pay to live in America instead of living, say, in Chad or Bangladesh or places that don't have all of these things. Warren Buffett said that if you dropped me in Bangladesh 30 years ago, I'd still be impoverished because they didn't have a, a banking system and they didn't have a stock market. Now, that is a view of government that's very, very different from a conservative view of government. It's a view of what a person is that's very, very different. And it is showing up in this campaign and it's showing up for an interesting reason and the brain has something to do with it and is something you should know. Twelve years ago, in Parma, Italy, an amazing discovery was made. Uh, this was in uh, Rizzolatti's lab. Uh, they were studying macaque monkeys, and they uh, were looking at how the premotor cortex works. The premotor cortex uh, coordinates complex actions like this, like taking a drink, which I'm going to do. If you looked at that, I had to open my hand, move my hand out, raise it, open the elbow, close the elbow. 
the motor cortex can only do those, in, those individual things. The premotor cortex has connection to the motor cortex that controls and coordinates those. It, co it choreographs actions. So they were looking at the premotor cortex of the monkey, and they had a probe in there with uh, a lot of pins that would go down that are very, very small, and could measure the activation of individual neurons. So that when the monkey was grabbing um, uh, uh, a, a ring, or peeling a banana, or pressing a bar, they could tell exactly which neurons were firing and how much. And they could register it on their computer. And every time a neuron fired, the computer would go blip, and the monkey would press the bar, and you'd hear blip, 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 and so on. The experimenter one day, it being Italy, said, OK, time for lunch. Bye. Went out for lunch, came back, saw a pile of bananas, picked one up, peeled it, and heard click, 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 click. But the machine was hooked to the monkey, not him. Turns out that the pre, those um, neurons in the premotor cortex fire when either the monkey did an action or saw someone else do the same action. They're called mirror neurons. This wasn't a miracle, so pardon that. Uh, the, uh, the idea was, is that there are <coughs> connections you're born with between the premotor and parietal cortex, which integrates perception, and that these get tuned uh, as you develop so that uh, exactly when you perform an action, you can, the same neurons will fire as when you see someone perform the same action. This has been found in people as well by different techniques. They don't you know, go down and put the probes in there, uh, unless with certain operations they actually have, but, that's, but not in the same place. Um, now, uh, it turns out that those neurons are connected to the emotional pathways. And that is why you can see somebody who is sad or happy or angry and tell what they're feeling. That is why you can feel someone else's pain. That is what empathy is about. Empathy is physical. Empathy is something we are physically set up to experience. And those neurons fire more when we cooperate even than when we imitate. Now, what that means is we are creatures who not just are there for self-interest, we naturally connect with other people. That's one, one of the reasons we cooperate with people, we form societies, and so on. Now, this has everything to do with progressive politics, because empathy is the heart of progressive politics, as we just saw. Now, uh, what does that have to do with the present campaign? What's particularly interesting about this campaign, there are a number of remarkable things. What is most remarkable to me is what is not discussed. Uh, the most interesting parts to me are, are never discussed by the, uh, the, by the pundits. And let me tell you some of what those things are. Uh, empathy is the heart of the Obama campaign. And Obama talks about it. He's never asked about it after he says it, but because they don't know what to do with it, but, uh, but he actually says it. For example, if you go, go online, Google the Selma speech. You can do that here. Uh, Google the Selma speech, and you will hear the expression, uh, the empathy deficit, over and over. If you go and uh, listen to the Philadelphia speech on race, it is called a more perfect union. And Obama there talks about how uh, the ideals of the country were imperfectly realized and how they should be more perfectly realized, why we need, quote, more freedom, more fairness, more caring, more opportunity. More caring, right in the middle of that. The next day, he was asked by Anderson Cooper on uh, 360, uh, what his view of patriotism was. And he said, patriotism begins with people caring about each other. That is why we have the principles of freedom and fairness. They come out of caring. A week later or so, he's interviewed by Ann Curry, 
of NBC. And she asks him, uh, what was the most important thing your mother taught you? An instant response, empathy, putting yourself in someone else's shoes. That's the most uh, important thing that a leader could have. It's the basis of human kindness. And if you listen to Obama's speeches, what you hear in the stories in each of those narratives is a story about empathy, about caring. And if you actually go and read his, the policy statements, uh, <clears throat> there is a Democratic policy magazine called The American Prospect. And in there, a couple of months ago, there was a story called The Obama Doctrine. Uh, and The Obama Doctrine about foreign policy is based on not just the national interest, not just diplomacy between states. Remember what the national interest is. The national interest says that every na nation maximizes military might, uh, the GDP, that is economic health, and um, political influence. That, that's what you should do in diplomacy. You should always seek to maximize the national interest because everybody else is trying to maximize theirs. That's the assumption. He says that really the major problems in the world are not just at the level of the state, they're at the level of the person. And the center of the Obama doctrine is empathy. It is human dignity. It has to do with problems that are real in the world that are not now considered part of foreign policy but should be, namely hunger, poverty, uh, public health around the world, uh, international global ecology, uh, women's rights, children's rights, labor issues, and so on. What he's saying is foreign policy has everything to do with empathy. What's interesting is how this is not discussed by any of the correspondents. Even if he says it, even if it's in the policy journals, no one has mentioned it. It's incredible. But let's take some other things that he actually says that are not discussed. Take the question of bipartisanship. It turns out that he and Hillary Clinton both talk about being bipartisan. And he talks about uniting the country in that way. What does he mean? And what does Hillary mean? It turns out they mean opposite things. When Hillary Clinton talks about bipartisanship, it means she's going to move to the right, that it, or what she calls the center. That is, she's going to say, I'm going to adopt some conservative principles in this case in order to get what I want to get enough votes to put some legislation through. That is, bipartisanship with her means adopting some conservative principles and giving up progressive principles. Obama means the very opposite. Obama recognizes that if you that everybody that there are these two modes of thought of uh, uh, strict and nurturant, but that we all learn both of them. That everybody is what I'll call a biconceptual. That we're conservative about some things and progressive about other things. And you can be progressive about everything in your active life, but if you can go into an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie and understand it then you have a strict father understanding of the world somewhere in your brain. And uh, most people are mixtures. And the mixtures are not left to right along the line, but all kinds of mixtures. There are people who are uh, progressive on foreign policy and conservative on economic policy, and the reverse. So take two people like Joe Lieberman and Chuck Hagel. Hagel, anti-war, very conservative. Uh, Lieberman, uh, pro-war, relatively liberal. They agree on almost nothing. They're both called moderates. There is no ideology of the moderate. A moderate is somebody who has, who does not have all of his views on, on uh, using one mode of thought, but has some here and some there, but they can be mixed all over the place. It's not just left to right. And that's an important thing to know politically. Now, how does Obama use this? Obama uses it in two very interesting ways. First, he understands that many people who call themselves conservatives 
actually have a lot of progressive views. They may, for example, love the land as much as any environmentalist. Uh, they may want to have a solid economy. Uh, they may care about really good educational systems. Uh, they may care about uh, living in a progressive community. Uh, they may be, uh, have progressive Christianity, for example, or some other form of progressive religion, even though they identify themselves, say, socially as conservatives. Now, um, what he then does with this is find the places where they agree with him and talk to them on that basis. That's bipartisanship from his point of view. And it's not understood by the conservatives. Conservatives say, he's not a real bipartisan. He doesn't go to the bipartisan caucus and come over to our side. And that's right, he doesn't. He has a different view. But there's another very important thing that Obama understands, which is that this country was formed on the basis of empathy. And that's an important thing that is not widely taught or widely known. There's a, an important book on this subject by a historian at UCLA named Lynn Hunt called Inventing Human Rights. What Lynn Hunt did was this. She took a look at the Declaration of Independence and she said, aha, it says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creators with certain inalienable rights, dot, 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 okay? And she says, when did it become self-evident? She's a historian, that's her job. So she says, okay, let's find out. Did it become self-evident with Descartes? That is, with uh, en Enlightenment values. <clears throat> you go back to the 1600s, in France, England, America, not self-evident. Not at all. You go back, you then say, okay, well, what about 1700 to 1725? Sorry, not self-evident. Didn't have them there. It wasn't until 1750 that these truths became self-evident. Why? What she found out was they came about through novels and art depicting the suffering and the horrors of poor people at the hands of people uh, who had power over them. That is, through empathy, through the development of empathy. And you find this at the beginning of our country. And that is what Obama understands. That those principles are not just liberal principles, they're American principles. He never identifies himself as a liberal or a progressive, he identifies himself as an American. And that is how he sees, wants to unify the country. Not discussed by the pundits. Now, why? Why isn't any of this understood? Enlightenment reason, which every journalist learns. If you, uh, I occasionally go and give lectures in the, to the graduate students in journalism at Berkeley. And I get maybe 10 or 15 minutes into the talk when somebody says, stop, you're contradicting everything we're being taught here. We're being taught it's who, what, when, where, why. It's objective. The language is objective. The ideas are objective. We're supposed to be objective. And you say, wait a minute. That's not how minds really work. That's not how language really works. Each word is defined with respect to some conceptual frame. That conceptual frame is in your brain physically. It's a neural, it's neural circuitry. And different people have different understandings of those words. Uh, I've written a book called Who's Freedom on the word freedom. 250 pages. Why? Because when I heard George Bush give his second inaugural address, he used the words freedom, free, and liberty 49 times in 20 minutes. And I said, what did he mean by that? Half of them were common, half of them were really weird to me and to many other liberals, but not the conservatives. What I did was I went and I looked at these things and I knew very well that there was a theory of what are called contested concepts. And we had been working on this for some time. Uh, a contested concept is one like freedom, democracy, art, etc., where different people have different versions of it, but there's a common version that everybody agrees on, and then because people have different values, the versions split and go in different directions. And that's true of freedom. The common version of freedom is very simple. 
It comes out of the metaphor of physical freedom. Uh, physical freedom has to do with freedom of motion, to move to a place, to move your body around, to get objects. And uh, that has to do with the metaphor that achieving a purpose is reaching a destination or getting something that, you're trying to, that you want to get. Uh, very common metaphors used all over the world. And freedom of action is seen as, as freedom of motion, freedom to move. And no, no, nothing bothers a kid more than being held down physically, than being held, you know, kept from moving the way they want to move. And not just a kid, me too. Uh, right? And part of freedom is the freedom to move freely, but not interfere with the freedom of others. We're free to walk down the street. We're not free to jump on somebody and tie them up. Okay? This is important. And then this applies not just to motion, but to anything you're trying to achieve. That's what freedom is about. And political freedom is having a government that promotes <coughs> those forms of freedom, freedom from harm, freedom to achieve your purposes in life. Now, um, if you start there, that's in common, and then you apply strict father and nurture and parent morality to the politics of it, to the market, to religion, and so on, you get complete bifurcation, two utterly different views of freedom. That's what the book Whose Freedom is about. And there's, I won't go through the 250 pages worth here. In fact, what I think I'll do is stop, because I think that you probably have some questions. Thank you. If you have questions, please use the mic so that we can be heard remotely and on camera. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hi. So um, if I remember correctly, well, I do remember that we had Steven Pinker here a little while ago. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> and I read his book. And if I remember correctly, he has a sort of a critique um, where he accuses you of, he, he seems to like your work, but accuses you of taking it a bit too far. Uh -huh. um, so, I mean, I, unfortunately, I just remember this on the way here, so I can't exactly remember his critique even, but can you just comment on that? I'd be delighted to. Thank you for asking. Uh, always a pleasure to contradict Steven Pinker. Um, <laughs> uh, Pinker hasn't really, I don't think he's really read the books. Uh, the one that he needs to read, or that should be read on uh, metaphor, is a book called Philosophy in the Flesh, uh, which goes through the neural theory of metaphor. The earlier book, uh, Metaphors We Live By, back in 1980, was the bare beginnings of an understanding of metaphorical thought and language. And that's the one that Pinker likes. And you know, it was fine. It said that there are map cross-domain mappings and things like that, and that the metaphors were in ideas, and they show up in language, and so on. What happened after that is we started finding that metaphor uh, was showing up very early in, in children, that the same metaphors were showing up around the world, not all of them, but what are called primary metaphors, simple ones, like more is up, like purposes or destinations, and so on. And we started doing field work on it and find them in, find those simple ones in culture after culture after culture. And we didn't understand why. Uh, finally, in uh, 1997, we got a neural theory of, language, of, of metaphor that came out of three dissertations at Berkeley. Um, one by Joe Grady on primary metaphors, sort of d describing their structures and what they were. One on uh, child language acquisition of metaphor by Chris Johnson. <clears throat> and the major one by Srini Narayanan, uh, who um, showed what, the, what a neural computational theory of metaphor would be like. And once you had that, you could see that neural learning theory, given the, theory, the understanding of how neural computation works, could talk, uh, talk about the learning of metaphor before all of these things. What that said is that, as a consequence, that metaphor is structuring your whole conceptual system early, and that you know, that uh, as you, uh, and that complex metaphors are combinations that is neural bindings of simple ones. That's the part that Pinker, I don't think, has gotten yet. I don't even know if he's read that part of the book or that book at all. But certainly, he's missing that. And once you see that you have metaphors like um, a governing institution is a family, and metaphors for morality, you know, such as 
Morality is obedience. Morality is purity. Morality is nurturance. Morality is uprightness, uh, it's, and many others. You can see where they come from, why they're there. You have an explanatory theory of it. But you also have an explanatory theory of how people think politically. And that it's not just all one and all the other, but mixtures. And what does that explain? It explains political discourse, how people are reasoning, how you understand what people are saying, if you do. And sometimes you don't. Uh, very often, liberals don't understand conservative arguments and vice versa. But if you do, this explains how you do. And the data is everywhere. The data is in every speech you hear. The data is in every article you read. The data is every time uh, anybody discusses anything about politics and gives an argument. That's data. Anytime they use language in it, that's data. That is the data that all this stuff is based on. Steve doesn't know this. And by the way, Steve's a smart guy. I'm not putting him down. It's just this is not his thing. <laughs> Uh, have you looked into the uh, different metaphors that are in use between uh, what we would consider common Western thought and that fueling the uh, religious fundamentalists in the Middle East that cause terrorism? Well, first of all, uh, what's interesting is a lot of them are the same. That is, if you look at the fun fundamentalism around the world, it's largely radical strict father reasoning without corresponding nurturant reasoning. Uh, so it all uh, has to do with obeying ultimate authority that is unquestioned, uh, with the use of power uh, and the idea that, that morality should be backed up with power. Uh, that is very common in conservative, what I call conservative thought, that is radical conservative thought. And uh, the same mode of thought is actually used in, in uh, fundamental Islam, in uh, radical conservatism, in fundamentalist Judaism, and so on. And you get nurturant thought similarly in, uh, in nurturant Islam. There's a, most, most Muslims in the world are not radicals. They're not fundamentalists. Most of them are nurturants. We're nurturant people. They're very sweet folks. And have you thought about uh, in, is it, what can we, how can we use this to try to bridge the gap? Would be more interesting and important of a question. Well, there's a number of interesting things going on right now. Uh, <clears throat> there's a movement in America to try to explain to Americans what nurturant Islam is, that most people who are Muslims are not fundamentalists at all. But it's important, let's say, uh, to understand what's going on in Israel and uh, in, among the Palestinians. You have both strict and nurturant versions of both religions there. And uh, the strict ones are screwing things up. Yeah. Uh, I'd just like to say I'm a huge fan of your work. I, I think I've been reading newspapers for 20 years and not really understanding uh, half of what I was reading uh, and, and until I read your book, Moral Politics, and, and was finally able to have a mental model of, of how the other side thought. Um, it, in the, the last chapter of that book, you discuss uh, the... Uh, Having been very sort of even-handed all the way up in terms of describing the concept, you talk about how these theories apply to actual child raising. Yes. Um, have there been any more developments uh, in that area since then, or have you got any more more comments on that area? Uh, the the developments are pretty much in the same direction. Uh, what I did in that chapter was simply um, go into the child uh, development literature. Uh, Berkeley has a very large institute for human development, and I went over there, talked to the people there, got all the literature I could find on this. Uh, it turns out there are three major traditions, uh, one of them having to do with attachment, uh, one having to do with socialization, and one having to do with abuse. And all of them reach pretty much the same conclusions, that uh, the worst way to raise a child is to neglect them, uh, or to beat them. The second worst way is to have a strict, strict father family, uh, a really strict father family, not in any way uh, cushioned by a nurtured mother, and so on. Uh, the next worst way is to have an indulgent family, where you let the kids do what they want. And the best way is a, uh, what's called an authoritative or nurturing family, 
where you nurture your children and you're responsible and you set appropriate limits to protect and empower them. Right? Uh, what happens under those conditions uh, is that uh, if uh, take values that most parents want. Uh, they want their kids to have their own view of what morality is, to understand it on their own without, without having to ask somebody else. Turns out that if you're raised in a nurturing family, that you do mostly. If you're raised in a strict father family, you're most likely to want to depend upon what other people tell you. Uh, it's part of authoritarian culture. Uh, it turns out that um, most parents want their children to be respectful of others and not aggressive toward them. Uh, that is mostly uh, comes from being raised in a nurturing family, uh, much less likely in a um, strict father family. Uh, they want their children to be able to be uh, socially functional, be able to get along with people very well, to be leaders. Much better if you're raised in a nurturing fam family than a, than a strict father family. They want their children to grow up and not abuse other people, not abuse their children, not abuse their spouses. Uh, much like, more likely in a, in a nurturing parent family, quite bad in the strict father families. In short, um, being raised in a strict father family is a dangerous thing. Yes, even, even by the strict father. Yeah, uh, it's, it's not good for kids. Um, on, a, on a completely different tack, um, <clears throat> Uh, all this stuff is very much based on the physical model of, of uh, how our, our brains work. Um, mm -hmm. How much of your work do you think w would apply also? To, how much of this is, is uh, a key to actually how you think? And how much would it also apply to artificial intelligences as opposed to being uh, something specific to, to humans? Well, uh, one of the things that we're doing at Berkeley is um, computational modeling of uh, neural computation. Uh, there's a fair amount of it going on. It's making some progress that's very, very impressive in language processing. Um, it would be very nice to be able to uh, have uh, a way to begin to do that in a serious fashion. Uh, but I wouldn't hold my breath. Uh, the brain is large. It's complicated. Um, you know, uh, absolutely huge. And it's not just size. It's very, very complicated. Um, you know, I, again, I wouldn't hold my breath. But too early to tell then. Yeah. Thank you. Hey there, can I uh, in both ask a question? Your, in your, <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, yes, please, hi. Just wondering. Um, just, uh, uh, I was actually going to tail off uh, the, the last question. The different types of families, initially when you were talking, you were talking about two main types of families, authoritative and nurturing. Um, so with these, uh, the more diverse kinds of families, I, I guess that's what I was first wondering, what kinds of families are there in, in all societies? Like what, what are the major categories? But you kind of address that. Um, but then kind of, uh, how does that apply to the social uh, organizations that we're then kind of ready for? Like, are there examples of like, uh, like a totalitarian dictatorial society? Is that kind of, a society that's going to come from a, a lot of kids who have been grown up in very stern families, or and then on the other end of the spectrum, Nazi Germany, for example. Okay, and then on the other end of the spectrum, is there anything besides kind of the kind of simplistic uh, democratic progressive society? Is there uh, I don't know, uh, like do you have any kind of good historical examples of really uh, excellent societies that? kind of w would be a, a, a target force to shoot for in progressive mode? Well, you get it in religious communities. Um, uh, historians in England are now trying to apply this uh, to the difference between Quakers uh, and other um, strict father Protestant groups. And uh, it turns out it fits reasonably well. It is not the case that those four models I gave are the same around the world. Uh, China works quite differently than America does. The uh, traditional Chinese family, which is changing right now because of uh, the constraints on children, but is still there, it's an extended family where uh, some elder is in charge of what goes on and where the children's, uh, the goals, life goals of the children 
are to help the family, not for themselves, but for the elders and for other people. And when the uh, elders get too old, they're to be taken care of, and then somebody else becomes the reigning elder. But the idea there is that the, if you're a child in one of these families, your job is not to, to take care of yourself, but to do what is necessary to help the family. This maps onto something in Chinese culture, where citizens of China are seen as uh, loyal if they take care of, uh, if they obey the leadership. And they're seen as disloyal and not really Chinese if they argue against the leadership. Uh, the notion of human rights in China is therefore really different from the notion that you have in America. Yeah? The, when you're talking about politics, you're talking about sort of a continuum, um, which would make sense if you were talking in the, the different kind of families you've got. But what if, and you're assuming you're, think that people's models of politics are based on good, on good families. But aren't there models of politics based on bad families? For instance, couldn't, couldn't you say that libertarianism is based on looking at really rotten families and, try, and not, trusting the, not trusting the government in such a way? That, I mean, Libertarianism is a version of conservatism on the whole. By the way, there are, let me just talk, say there are uh, liberal libertarians, and let's talk about both kinds. Um, the Cato Institute types, uh, have to do with a very important part of the strict family model that I didn't get to talk about. In a strict fa a father family, uh, the father is in charge and uh, until the child is mature. And if the child becomes uh, uh, a mature moral adult, they can then go off and be their own strict fathers or strict mothers. They can take care of themselves. However, if they're not able to do that, then uh, the parents are, um, you know, supposed to, um, you know, give them tough love, right? Not help them, you know, send them off. But once uh, the child is mature and off on their own, the parents are not allowed to meddle in their lives. And you see this in conservative discourse all the time. Uh, there's a marvelous example uh, that came up during the Clinton administration where um, the conservatives were trying to put, push through a balanced budget amendment. And the Democrats defeated it by one vote. And Bob Dole, who was majority leader of the Senate, got on TV and started railing against uh, people who think that Washington knows best. Now, think about Washington knows best. Blank knows best is from father knows best. Everybody in the country heard this, immediately understood it. That is, these are people who are saying, you know, uh, we should be on our own, we shouldn't have this strict father telling us what to do, et cetera, uh, which is a lot to do with uh, conservative antipathy toward the government. Uh, that's what the conservative um, uh, libertarians are largely about. Uh, progressive libertarians uh, are focusing on uh, empowerment and fulfillment in life very much as part of what they're doing. And in some cases, they happen to overlap. And they also focus on responsibility, which is part of what nurturance is. So you get that as possible. You also get people who are partly conservative and partly liberal in certain, some things. So you're going to get uh, a number of different versions of uh, this sort of thing. Hi. Hi. Thank you for coming. I'm a um, big fan of your books. Thanks. Um, so, Four years ago, or four years and I guess six months ago, Howard Dean was um, uh, often saying, um, I want my country back. And it would get huge applause. And, and I was one of the people applauding, but then- So was I. Then when I went home, um, I would hear neighbors say things like, what do you mean he wants our country back? Where, where did it go? It's still between Canada and Mexico. I totally don't understand this. And, um, the big catchphrase now is, is talking about change. And I'm wondering what is change, what metaphors do ch does change evoke? And also, is, um, is it a positive or a negative thing? I mean, I think a lot of people fear change. Well, when he puts change and hope together, it's positive. Okay. There's a reason why they go together, uh, to get rid of the fear part. Uh, hope is the antidote to fear. All right. it's the, it activates the positive 
neural pathways. Fear activates the negative neural pathways. And that's the whole idea of what hope is about. It does that. Uh, when he's referring to change, he's referring to um, all of the uh, not very nice conservative things that have been done in the past eight years and, and more than eight years. Uh, and I think people intuitively know what they are. And it's change uh, because he's so much uh, uh, talking about empathy or arousing it, it's change in that direction. It's change in a government that cares about its people, about its children, about its future, and so on. Uh, very, very different uh, idea than you would have otherwise. Do you think that carries over in a sound bite? It, it doesn't carry over by itself. And, and this is very important. Sound bites and slogans mean nothing by themselves. Mm. It's only in the context of everything else, in his body language, in his, his voice, in the actual um, unconscious things that are coming out of the speeches. Uh, in the, the way empathy is, is used, for example, that carries the content of what the change is. When people say, um, yes, we can, doesn't have any meaning. I was called up at one point by CBS News, and they said, why should people be cheering on yes, we can when it doesn't mean a damn thing? And I said, have you listened to what was said before yes, we can? <laughs> right? And he would give a list of all the horrible things that were done and things that could not be done um, uh, with you know, old ideas in Washington and with conservative ideas and even old liberal ideas. And then at the end of that, when he said, yes, we can, he's contrasting with those. And then everybody knows what it means. That's why they're cheering. The words in themselves don't mean anything. It's what they refer to in context and through the cognitive unconscious. Thank you. Great. Well, yes. I have just Hi. one more. Um, I just wanted to ask you, um, given the context of everything we've just heard, maybe just um, your thoughts about what happened with Obama and his pastor. And that to me is like one of the most confusing things about how did how did Obama and his pastor kind of seemingly he was in that church for a long time, but they come out of it and they're on totally different sides. Okay, uh, let me first talk about the word pastor. First of all, how often did you hear the word pastor before two months ago? I grew up in the South, so I heard it a okay, lot. Okay, so you got more pastors <laughs> down there, right. Well, most of America, you know, the word pastor has been showing up on TV and radio and so on much more than it used to. What does the word pastor mean? It's based on a metaphor, and it's the metaphor of shepherd and sheep. And the assumption is that a pastor, who is a religious leader, has a flock to lead, and they're sheep. That is, they do what he tells them. So if somebody is in the church and has a pastor, the implication is that they're going to believe what the pastor believes. Right? Now, this needn't be true at all, as Obama has said. That is, it could be that you're, you're an independent thinker, right? Most people probably sit in church and don't believe half the things that the pastor says, right? But we have that metaphor, and when that metaphor is there, and it's taken hold of the context, and you're thinking in terms of that metaphor, and you don't even know that you're doing it, that's how you get the inference that Obama would expect, you'd expect Obama to believe what the pastor believes. That's part one. Then there's a question of what has the pastor been saying that's been so offensive? Have you heard the entire speech, not just the sound bites? Uh, no, not, not start to finish. I have. And uh, it's Berkeley, KPFA, record, you know, broadcast the entire thing. And it's actually a fairly interesting speech. Uh, the speech was about uh, oppression in America from the beginning, the oppression of the Native Americans, uh, how uh, originally, uh, only white um, property owners, uh, white male property owners could vote. Uh, the history of slavery, uh, you know, the history of how women uh, didn't have the vote and had to fight for it. Most of the talk is about that. And it's very punitive. That is, it's about what has wrong, been wrong with America from the beginning and how it's gotten better, but how it's still bad. 
but it's, it's, it has to do with this being wrong from the beginning. So that's piece number one, but he recognizes that, and the parts that have been wrong are true. And Obama has probably heard lots of that. In addition to that, uh, do you know what the church does? Um, his church specifically? Yeah. I, mean, I guess I just assume that it does what most churches does, which is just sort of activate their community. and. They have specific social programs. Social programs uh, to work with uh, victims of AIDS, social programs for poor people, for people uh, you know, uh, who uh, don't have food, and so on. Uh, the reason that Obama found that church was that he was a community organizer, and he was working with churches to get them to do community organization. And they had one of the best set of social programs. So his reason for being in the church had to do with their social programs, and yes, he heard things that were bad. Now, when Obama gave the speech uh, called A More Perfect Union, what he said was, this country has great ideals. It didn't live up to them all, but it's getting better. And he said, in fact, the fact that I'm here shows it's getting better. Okay? But his pastor didn't believe it's getting better. His pastor kept focusing on all the negatives, which is not what he does. So although that you can see how he could be in, in that church perfectly well for a long time, find it okay. He didn't happen to be there for that speech. And, um, and there's a lot of people. There are thousands of people in that church, not just him and 12 other people. So uh, it's important to understand the details of this if you're going to understand what happened there. And, and I think he did have to quit for various reasons. Any, anything else on that? Well, just sort of the, um, I mean, if, it, just, I guess he has to leave the church because there's, on a surface level, he can't be seen on the political stage as agreeing with these things. That, and he disagrees with them. Right. In fact, uh, you know, as president, you know, because people have that logic of what a pastor is and actually use it, he can't have that interfering with his campaign or with his presidency, and it interferes with the church. It interferes with those thousands of people uh, worrying about what reporters are going to show up this week. I guess it's not so much that I, I don't disagree with how Obama handled the situation. It's more like I don't understand the, the pastor kind of deliberately or not deliberately undermining like what happened there. The pastor has, uh, is a biconceptual. He has nurturing goals and strict father means. He was a Marine. I think that's, uh, I think it's unfortunately all we have time for. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Uh, Professor Lakoff again for coming in. Thank you. And thank you all for coming and enjoy the book. <laughs>